from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Library of Congress. Welcome to this celebratory event for a great day here. I finally have some nice weather here in Washington. I'm so glad that we're happening, it's happening today. We are here to celebrate the winners of the 2015 Library of Congress Literacy Awards. My name is David Mao, and I have the privilege of serving as the acting librarian of Congress. And again, welcome to the library. The Library of Congress Literacy Awards originated with and is sponsored by philanthropist David Rubenstein. The awards, first announced in January 2013, help support organizations that work to promote reading and literacy in the United States and around the world. The awards highlight and reward organizations for their exemplary, innovative, and easily replicable work. Now these awards, they benefit not only the winners, but also new groups, organizations, and individuals through the best practices of all of our applicants. Um, and so anywhere around the world, people can be involved in alleviating the scourge of illiteracy. And that's one of the benefits of all of these uh, awards. We're very fortunate to have with us today our very generous benefactor, David Rubenstein. He has perfected what he has called patriotic philanthropy uh, through the many gifts to institutions uh, around the country and more specifically in this area uh, to the Kennedy Center, the Washington Memorial, uh, I'm sorry, the Washington Monument, the National Zoo, and if you read the news just this past Monday announcing a great gift to uh, help uh, recreate the Lincoln Memorial. And so we're very, very privileged to have David as a very generous sponsor to the Library of Congress and he's been a sponsor and a patron to us for many, many years. Uh, his projects, the projects that we have here would not be achievable without his great support and we thank him very much for that. One in particular that I will just mention since it's related to the literacy awards that we're celebrating today is the Library of Congress National Book Festival which is now in its 16th year and we are very grateful that David funds the program through his generosity. Now when David's not being a philanthropist, he is the co-founder and co-CEO of the Carlisle Group. He's sitting right here in the front row, so I, I would ask you that you join me in acknowledging and thanking David Rufusstein for all of his support. <laughs> for the past three years, the awards have been administered by the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress. Um, the director is Dr. John Cole, and John is up right over here. Uh, so I want to acknowledge the staff of the Center for the Book and in particular Dr. Cole for the great work that they've done in, in contributing to the success of the awards. Thank you. Thank you, John. In addition, over the last three years, we've had the benefit of the Literacy Awards Advisory Board and they've given their time and expertise to make these excellent selections every year. So for those members of the uh, Literacy Awards Advisory Board that are here with us, thank you very much for your generous comp contributions to the success of this program. Thank you. <laughs> now at this time, I'm very pleased to introduce a very special guest, Michael Durda, renowned book critic for the Washington Post. He's a graduate of Oberlin College and has a doctorate in comparative literature from Cornell University. Since 1978, Michael has enlightened readers with his opinions on writers, uh, both very well known and perhaps not so famous. Uh, and he even received a Pulitzer Prize for criticism in 1993. He's helped readers discover forgotten masterpieces and brought needed attention to the classics in the making. So we're very excited to have Michael Durda with us. Please join. Thank you. Thank you, David. First of all, can you all hear me all right? It's fine. Signal wildly if you can't. Uh, I was lucky enough to be taught to read by my mother. After finishing the dishes, she would plump down on the dining room floor next to the heat register and take me, washed up, ready for bed, onto her lap. 
There on the floor, she would then open a tattered golden book and point with a fingertip red and wrinkled by detergent and hot water to the book's first page. Look, Michael, see the cute yellow chicky, or the pokey little puppy, or the very naughty bunny. As I snuggled there in my mother's lap, feeling the warm air of the furnace blowing on me, I would drift into a contented sleepiness. Over time, though, I began to pay more and more attention to the books themselves, partly because my beloved mother seemed to derive so much pleasure from the pictures and those funny little squiggles. On a day I can no longer remember, I deduced, like a four-year-old Sherlock Holmes, that those squiggles were the letters C-A-T, were pronounced cat, and stood for the animal pictured on the page above. When John Cole asked me to speak at this afternoon's ceremony for the Literacy Awards, I began to mull over what I might say. We hear a great deal these days about computer literacy, but sometimes forget that it is print literacy, the ability to understand the meaning of written words, which actually ushers most of us into a world larger than ourselves. Learning to read, though, isn't at all intuitive. It takes hard work and persistence on the part of parents, teachers, and organizations like those we honor today, before a child can suddenly achieve that eureka moment when the letter C-A-T, the picture of a mischievous animal playing with a ball of yarn, and the word cat all come together. Once those fundamental interconnections are made, though, the truly life-enhancing stages of literacy actually begin. These stages might be labeled enchantment, understanding, and power. Our earliest reading is the age of adventure. We pick up books for excitement, for wonder, for the most basic enchantments of plot and narrative. In my own generation, we discover stories with irresistible titles like Danny Dunn and the Anti-Gravity Paint, Miss Pickerel Goes to Mars, and the Boxcar Children. We follow the never-ending battles between Uncle Scrooge and those dastardly Beagle Boys, roared maniacally over joke books with titles like Yours Till Niagara Falls, and eventually settled down for a couple of years with the endless adventures of the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew. A little later, perhaps, a librarian might suggest a book intriguingly titled The Secret Garden. Or at the local Salvation Army, we might unearth an old paperback of Journey to the Center of the Earth. Or a cousin would lend us the short stories of Edgar Allan Poe. In the 21st century, only the particular titles might be different. Kids read now about Harry Potter rather than Tom Swift, Jr. But the overall pattern remains the same. Still, it pleases me to know that Beverly Cleary, whose Henry Huggins books I eagerly searched for in third grade, will be 100 in April. As we all know, the true golden age of reading is 12, or possibly 13. Does life get any better than the dark and stormy night we first turned the pages of The Hound of the Baskervilles? On just such a night, I myself discovered the spectral hellhound and learned the curse of the curse laid on the Baskerville family and listened as Dr. Mortimer told of the recent death of Sir Charles Baskerville. Near the body, Mortimer informed Sherlock Holmes were footprints. The great detective immediately asks, a man's or a woman's? To which question he receives what is merely the most thrilling reply in all of literature. Mr. Holmes, they were the footprints of a gigantic hound. <laughs> While enchantment and excitement are important to any reader at, at any age, there does come a time when one begins to yearn for more than just escape. As we grow older, we realize that books don't only transport us to fairy lands forlorn, they also tell us about the world we live in. 
More and more we read to acquire knowledge. In school, we learn through books about history. We study key works of literature. We review our Latin or French or Arabic grammars. We prop up newspapers and magazines or smartphones next to our bowl of breakfast cereal to find out about politics and current affairs and the latest baseball scores. Meanwhile, novels like Pride and Prejudice and The Red and the Black teach us about love. Our horizons expand. We enter adulthood. Through such youthful reading, we grow in understanding, acquiring a sense of what the world is like and what we need to know to navigate our way through it. Gradually, too, we discover the third gift of literacy, a consciousness of power, of confidence in ourselves. When I was a boy, I devoured all the self-help books of Dale Carnegie, best known for How to Win Friends and Influence People. Throughout his work, Carnegie repeatedly emphasized that successful careers and to some degree fulfilling lives come more readily to those who can speak and write well, who know history, literature, and the arts, who have read great books, and have become, in the broadest sense, educated men and women. For all his popularity among business people, Carnegie was a strong advocate of the liberal arts. If you couldn't attend college, and remember, he wrote during the Depression when many couldn't. You could still go to the library or the bookstore. You could teach yourself if you knew how to read. Such a pian to literacy may now sound a little old-fashioned in our age of Facebook and Twitter. But if you consult the memoirs of poor kids who have made good, you know that books are always understood as the key to their later success. In prison, Malcolm X copied out by hand the entire dictionary so that he might improve his vocabulary and better himself. More recently, a son of a working class Italian father and a Mexican mother, Dana Joya, would, through reading, rise to become the chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts and one of the country's finest poets. Books and the knowledge found in them enrich our souls, yes, but they also form the foundations for a consequential life. The reader's journey then leads from enchantment to understanding to power. But it all begins with learning to recognize the letters of the alphabet on flashcards, then the simple words in picture books. Literacy is the engine that drives the world. The illiterate and illiterate only drift aimlessly. Those who can read, those who love to read, can go anywhere and do anything. Certainly, the three organizations we honor today know this far better than I. They deserve our gratitude and our applause. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, for those inspiring words and a great way to start us off as we now celebrate the awardees, because I have the pleasure now of uh, issuing those awards. So I will ask that David, if he will join me up here so that we can honor our winners. Our first winner that we will honor is the winner of the David Rubinson, Rubinstein Prize, and that is First Book, represented by CEO Kyle Zimmer. Our second awardee is the winner of the American Prize, United Through Reading, represented by CEO Sally Anzal. And finally, the winner of the International Prize, Beanstalk 
represented by CEO Ginny Lun. Now we will have an opportunity he to hear from each of our winners, and we will first hear from Ginny from Beanstalk. Thank you very much. It's truly a privilege to be here this afternoon, and I'm really honored to be amongst all of you. And actually, last night when I arrived here from London, I thought I was truly honored. My full name is Virginia. When I arrived, it said, welcome to Virginia. So I, thought, so I thought, oh, that's amazing, just for me. So um, I have been to the States before. When I was 18, I was a bit um, of a struggling child myself. I didn't really know where I was going or what I was aiming to do. And so I spent a year in Oklahoma City. I know some people might say, why did you choose there? I think it sort of chose me. Um, so I spent a year there, and then I went on and joined a traveling carnival. So I, th I always think of America as the place where it really kick-started my career, because I sort of learned about myself, I went back and studied English, and then I went on to become a primary school teacher. So I kind of think it's this country that has brought me here today. So I thank the nation for that, so thank you. Um, I'm here, though, to talk about Beanstalk. Um, before I do that, I do want to just say a few words of thanks. Um, I started as CEO in June this year. Well, 2015, actually. So I haven't been the CEO for long, so I really feel I can't take credit for the fact that we've won this award. So I want to thank all the children, the volunteers, the schools we work with, and all my Beanstalk team who have made it possible for us to win this award. We're a small charity in England with big ambitions, and to get this award is just truly amazing. Um, and I'd like to thank Jared Brading, who gave us a recommendation, and also um, Save the Children, Melissa Smith, who wrote a letter recommending us. And Save the Children is one of our partners who are helping us to grow and develop across the UK, which is amazing. So can I also thank David Rubenstein and the Library of Congress. I think what you're doing here is incredible. Um, I have looked back at the other awards, things like Planet Read, Reach Out and Read, other organizations that have won these awards, and there's such good practice, and I think it's really brilliant that this event is taking place because we can all learn so much from each other. So thank you for that. Um, but what's Beanstalk? I'm sure some of you are thinking, what is Beanstalk? Um, we were founded, so I'm supposed to nod at the back. I wanted it, Bean, Ooh, there should be a picture of a woman. There we go. So I couldn't talk about Beanstalk without recognizing our founder, Susan Belgrave, who I see as an inspirational woman, a role model who started Beanstalk in 1973, and we kind of call her our magic bean because she had an idea, she saw a problem. The problem was that there were lots of children leaving primary school unable to read well. Sadly, that's still pretty much the case today, although it is improving in certain areas, but there are real pockets around England that are doing really poorly. Susan saw that, and she gathered some of her friends around her kitchen table and she hatched a plan. And what she came up with was really simple, and I think sometimes it's the solutions that are just so simple that are the ones that can make the biggest difference. So she recruited volunteers, she trained them, and then she put them into primary schools to help those struggling readers. So they go in twice a week, consistently for a year, and we know in that time, it really does turn children's lives around. It's a model that works, she started it, and over 43 years later, where she started with three volunteers in seven schools, we now have helped over 100,000 children. We have over 3,000 volunteers. 
and we're in over 1,200 schools. So it's growing. We have big ambition. We want to double what we do by 2018. I think being here today and helping us raise our profile is going to really help us on that path. And I think another thing that's really important to stress is that it's all about mobilizing local people. So a lot of what we do to get our volunteers is mobilizing local people to join together and help those struggling children. So it's mobilizing communities to help the next generation. I think it is an amazing model. So I'm going to now, so Susan, thank you to Susan. Um, could we now have the film, I'm gonna show you a short film which has just been made recently, which is the story of one of our reading helpers and the voice of the child that she's helping. It's an animated film, so please press that button. Ellie's story. So Ellie was afraid to read at first. So we played lots of I Spy with colours rather than words because they confused her. She absolutely loved princesses and anything pink. So we read piles of fairy tale comics. It was a struggle, but Ellie stuck at it. And before long, we were reading short books. Her teacher said that Ellie's always been shy of reading in class. But one day, when she was handing out water bottles with all the children's names on them, Ellie came over and said, I can do it. I can read now. I'd watched Ellie grow in confidence. It made me feel amazing just to think that she wasn't afraid to read anymore. Become a Beanstalk reading helper today to make a lasting difference to a child like Ellie. So it's very simple, straightforward. And the school teacher said to me the other day, this is, it's all about the quality of the reading helper. They sprinkle our children with magical fairy dust and open up the wonderful world of books to them. So we know it works and we're trying to do it more and more. But also, it's not just about delivering what we do. What's really important to me and to the rest of Beanstalk is that we are part of big campaigns to take the message of what happens when a child can't read, when they feel that their potential is limited. You know, it's really important that we get that message out to get more support to our children. So we join forces with, there's just some examples um, of local newspapers. We're doing a campaign with BBC Radio 4 this summer. We, we also... Um, partner with Mature Times, that says what it is. Saga, if some of you don't know, is for 55 plus. Um, so we do partner with people who can get to the volunteers that we want to reach. Waitrose, is there Waitrose in the States? I don't know. It's a big superstore all across the UK. Um, and basically it's a magazine read by millions. So we really do look to partner and make innovative partnerships to get our message out there. And also, part of our strategy is to be part of big campaigns. We were a founding member of Read On, Get On, which was, is led by Save the Children, but it's got hundreds of partnerships, all uh, getting together, joining forces to help raise literacy levels and make sure children do not leave primary school, age 11, unable to read well. So we're part of that and very proud to be part of that. Also, a European campaign called Elanet, and another global campaign you may have heard of, Project Literacy, which Pearsons are involved in, which is talking about tackling global illiteracy. So it's really important to be part of that bigger picture, which is why I think we're all here today, because it's important to be part of that overall, join the cause, do something, um, and make sure we can change the lives, change the story for thousands and thousands of children and adults who are suffering with not being able to read well. Um, and I just wanted to end with a thank you from the children of Beanstalk. Thank you, Stalk. I love my reading helper. Yay! Thank you. And now we'll hear from United Through Reading. 
Okay, John, I got the clicker. That's dangerous. Uh, where's Michael who spoke to us? Thank you very much. You suggested that your words might be a little old fashioned. For me, it was the best blast from the past that I've had in a long time. So thank you very much. That was lovely. Thank you all, the Library of Congress. It's an incredible honor to be here and accept this award on behalf of United Through Reading. I would like to thank David Mao, the Acting uh, Librarian of Congress, David Rubenstein, of course, and John Cole, our good friend, and the National Advisory Board to the Library of Congress Literacy Awards. Thank you all so very much. I also would like to thank friends of United Through Reading who are with us today, including Mrs. Ellen Dunford, General Mrs. Carter Ham, and special United Through Reading beneficiaries, Emma and Sam and Jackson. Thank you very much for being here. We are honored to be in the company of amazing organizations like First Book and Beanstalk, and so we're thrilled to share a little bit about what we are at United Through Reading. United Through Reading was founded in 1989 and began serving the military during the first Gulf War. Our founder, Betty Mullenbrock, was the wife of a Navy flight surgeon, and when he deployed to Vietnam, their daughter was a year old when he re when she returned when he returned she didn't recognize him a year, year later <clears throat> betty was also a reading teacher who saw children starting school not prepared to read and unprepared to learn and so these two experiences came together for her with this bold idea that service members could stay connected with each other during separations through the simple act of reading a storybook aloud and so like you said earlier it is simple what we do is very simple, but to profound effect. Our mission is to unite military families facing physical separation by facilitating the bonding experience of reading aloud together. And our vision is that all children will feel the security of caring family relations and develop a love of reading through that read aloud experience. As many of you know, military families face unique challenges. Despite incredible bravery, resilience, and strength, military families, especially the children, have increased risk, risk factors that are associated with frequent moves and deployments that often bring instability to our military families. Research indicates that children from active duty military families experience significantly more uh, levels, higher levels of emotional difficulties during family separations than children of the general population. And in a recent study, one third of our military children surveyed reported symptoms of anxiety. Longer deployments are linked to greater difficulties in children's social and emotional functioning. And if that weren't distressing enough, a recent study by the RAND Corporation found an association between military children who have endured long separations from a parent and lower achievement in reading and math. So counterbalancing, counterbalancing these findings, there's good news reported by numerous studies that point to a very simple thing to help these children. The single most important activity for building earliest emergent reading skills appears to be reading aloud to children. It's simple. And this conclusion is also at the very heart of United Through Reading. We use that treasured family practice of story time to sustain healthy family bonds during separations and alleviate the stress for family members. And both are essential to helping our at-risk children in learning to love reading. The photo that you see right now is of a young sailor who was at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego recovering from wounds of war when he participated in our program. And reading together was a great opportunity to connect through a familiar, comforting routine. As you can see from the happy and engaged faces on these children, this dad has indeed instilled a love of reading in his kids. United Through Reading was the first nonprofit to promote the read aloud experience to bring separated families together. And so from nearly two location, 200 locations on land and at sea, United Through Reading offers, offers servicemen and women the opportunity to be video recorded reading a storybook and sending those with the books home to their children. Again, it's simple to profound effect. And the experience of reading together 
ease, erases and eases the anxieties of separation and helps family members stay connected. The enduring value is this. The stories read by faraway parents to children at home nurture literacy in this very special group of vulnerable children. Just as you can see this little guy trying to crawl right into the TV, daddy is in that room just as sure as shooting. For more than 25 years, this concept has proven itself over and over again. Deployed military parents are reading to their children from outposts in Afghanistan, Djibouti, Bahrain, Ethiopia, on U.S. naval ships, on Coast Guard cutters, in base libraries and military medical centers, and in 70 USOs. Nearly two million mothers, fathers, and children who are separated by oceans, deserts, and time zones have sustained family bonds and nurtured young readers through the quintessential tradition of reading stories together. And so here's how we do it. The service member reads a book to their child on video and sends the video home with the book. The child at home watches the UTR video and follows along. The caregiver at home, whether it's mom or grandma or auntie, captures the child's reaction, watching. And then we send that picture or that video back to the service member. And the service member's morale is boosted by the feedback and he or she is encouraged to read again. And so it's a great circle of communication that keeps it going. The book itself is a very important component of United Through Reading's program. Research shows that there's a direct correlation between the amount of books children own and their reading levels. Our hope is that participation in United Through Reading will help to build children's personal home libraries. Each quarter, we partner with our good friends, and this year's David M. Rubenstein Prize winner, first book, to select titles for use in our program. So thanks to Kyle Zimmer and her amazing team, these books are then shipped to United Through Reading program locations around the world. We collaborate to select titles that speak to special days that mom or dad's going to miss during deployment, such as, look out kindergarten, here I come, or Arthur's Loose Tooth, as well as those beloved bedtime classics that we've all read, Good Night Moon and Guess How Much I Love You. There's something incredibly powerful about a child holding the same book in his hands that his mama held, reading it to him from halfway around the world. And we hear stories all the time from families who tell us that their kiddos take their United Through Reading books with them everywhere as a touchstone to their faraway hero. The obvious question is, why not Skype? And that's a good question, and we want families to Skype, and we want them to Facebook and email and write and communicate through any means available. But there are some important reasons why United Through Reading can be the essential supplement to those family communications. For example, time differences. When it's nap time in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, it's the middle of the night in Afghanistan. Time zones and operational demands of our service members don't often line up for service members and their families. And even when they do, sometimes the stars don't quite align. Where service members are deployed, training, working, that precious bandwidth when it's available is most often needed for operational activities. And so unreliable connections can mean disappointing conversations, and that's when the bandwidth is there. Often it's simply not. With United Through Reading videos, parents and children alike can rely on availability and repeatability. We call it mommy and daddy on demand. <laughs> Anyone who has ever read to a child knows that children love to hear the same story over and over and over and over again. And we know that this repetition may drive us crazy, but it's a wonderful way to build vocabulary and word recognition. And we have loads of proof too. For example, General and Mrs. Odierno's five-year-old grandson watched his first video 17 times the first day. <laughs> and the reason we know that is because his parents were so amazed that they started counting. I'm pleased to tell you that our beneficiaries report that United Through Reading works. Program surveys tell us that 81% of our participants re report a decrease in their children's anxiety. 88% report an increase in connectedness. 
90% of participants report that participation reduces their own stress. And that's really important and very encouraging because while children were the initial focus of United Through Reading, the adult service member is a key beneficiary as well. And that's great news in light of the mental health issues that our service members are coming home with. 78% of participants report increases in their child's interest in reading and books. And like General and Mrs. Odier and his grandchild, we know that more than 80% of the recordings are watched every day or several times a day. And it's not unusual for children to watch a recorded story 250 times during a 10-month deployment. So do the math with me. That means that 25,000 recordings enjoyed by two eager children in a home amounts to one million bedtime stories in a year. As I'm sure you know, we believe that parents have a fundamental role as children's first teachers to help them acquire pre-literacy skills. And in June of 2014, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommended that pediatricians tell parents that they should be reading together as a daily fun family activity from infancy. We absolutely agree. United Through Reading has equipped military parents to do that for more than 25 years. And plus, reading to children enhances vocabulary and other communication skills. We recognize that story time forms a critical bond between parents and children, and it provides moments to share things that might be left unsaid in the chaos of a normal family day, especially when that normal family day takes place over the course of a 10 month deployment and families are separated by oceans and continents. United Through Reading trains volunteers to oversee each site and on how to engage children and draw them into stories. And as I mentioned, each site has a selection of high quality, age appropriate books that service members can read. We also celebrate certain events throughout the year. In this particular picture, these service members are from Task Force Sinai, and they are celebrating Dr. Seuss's birthday on Read Across America Day. All of this adds up to a profoundly powerful connection being made by military families who are facing seemingly insurmountable odds. Parents maintain their vital roles as first teachers. They build early literacy skills in their children, children who associate story time with joyful opportunities to connect with their mom and dad, as you can he see here in this video. We have four children. Ryan is 11, Annalie is nine, Luanna is six, and Emmalyn is four. My dad is on a ship. He's on a ship because he's on deployment. So when now I'm four and then when my dad gets home, um, I'm going to be this 12. Every day, there's always something that we miss. Daily stuff. I mean, big things are hard too, you know, not being here for holidays or birthdays, anniversaries, things like that. Those are tough because it's, it's a special day that he's missing, but, you know, for us, it's, it's the everyday, just everyday moments that we miss out on. Since reading is such a big part of our, our routine and, you know, he'll sit there and they'll surround him when he's sitting there on the bed and he'll read him a story and, like they said, he gets animated. So, for him to be on a DVD that they can see and, and hear him, I know that they're just going to be over the moon to, to have that connection that, because it is a part of our routine, so he will still be a visible part of our routine then. It feels like he's sitting in front of us reading and it, it makes me feel kind of sad, but not really because I love him so much. I miss him a lot. <laughs> Kitty cat looks creepy. <laughs> purple cat, purple cat, what do you see? I see a white dog looking at me, a white dog. <laughs> <laughs> Deployments are not gonna stop anytime soon, and I just like the fact that the programs that we have are able to keep me in contact with the family. United Through Reading is a, is a great tool to help my kids better cope with me being gone and actually help me cope uh, with being away from them also. That was a good book.
This work is an honor, a joy, and a delight. And on behalf of our Board of Trustees, our staff, our supporters, and our beneficiaries around the world, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for recognizing United Through Reading and for your support of the military families we so proudly serve. We are humbled to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we'll hear from First Book. That is uh, a tough act to follow. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. It's uh, a tremendous honor to be here. Thank you uh, to David Rubenstein, the Library of Congress, John Cole, who is uh, heart and soul with First Book all these years in the center of the book. Um, I, I'd also like to congratulate our fellow award winners. I've, I've known these groups and we've worked with them, uh, especially United Through Reading. And it is, um, it, it's just a tremendous honor to, to share this day with them because of everything they do. This event is also a wonderful way to salute everyone who's helped First Book for more than 24 years. We're very, very grateful for the recognition. I want to accept the award on behalf of the First Book Network. This is the largest and fastest growing network of formal and informal educators serving children in need in North America now. Numbering more than 225,000 classrooms and programs. These are an inspiring group of people. And I tell you, I wish I could introduce you to every single one of them. But in place of that, we'll introduce you to one uh, through this video, if I may. As a child, books were my way of being able to learn about the world outside of the housing project that I lived in. Woodland Terrace is a very difficult environment to inspire hope. Smart from the Start is a family support and community engagement initiative founded really as an answer to widespread school underachievement. The goal of SMART is really to help folks on the ground understand that there is no better teacher for a child than their parent. Just simply having books in their home is a great way for us to do that. We had an opportunity to meet First Book and almost immediately First Book began to flood our program with beautiful, high-quality new books. Literally thousands of brand new books have gone out into the community. We wouldn't be able to afford to do that if it wasn't for the generosity and the hard work of First Book. I just cannot imagine a better gift for a child than a book. Giving a child a book is giving them the gift of wider horizons. It gives them a chance to exercise their imagination. It gives them an opportunity to share a special moment with the person that they love. It really gives them an opportunity to dare to dream. Now that we have this partnership with First Book, we're able to introduce families to opportunities and resources. This is how we change the fabric of communities. One family, one parent, one father, one child at a time. So with heroes like that, I can, you, you know, you can easily see how we're inspired every single day at First Bug. And I realize at a beautiful event like this, at one of my favorite buildings in all of Washington, that I'm supposed to be inspiring and hopeful. But I have to be honest with you, and you know, it, it's, it's difficult. I've been doing this job and working in this field for more than 25 years, and I think that we have to look each other in the eye and recognize one really critical fact. 
our system's broken. We, we're standing in one of the wealthiest countries in the world, a country that is founded on democracy and equality. And frankly, we're falling far, far short of that promise. At first book, that keeps us up at night. And frankly, it, it ought to keep all of us up at night. And I, I just want to share with you, at the risk of making this sound like a gigantic group therapy session, I want to share with you a couple of the things that are keeping me awake. The first thing is the sheer size of the problem. Our current educational crisis is so vast, and our solutions, they have to be equal to that challenge. This last year, we crossed a threshold. 51% of kids in the United States in public schools, 51% are from low-income families. The link between poverty and low literacy is very well established. It shouldn't surprise any of us to see that 80% of low-income fourth graders are not reading at proficient levels. And another way to say 80% is to say almost none. Almost none of those children are confident readers. And so to shift a trend of that size, we've got to build large scale solutions. Solutions that will really produce the dramatic results that we need. And that is what First Book is all about. We have built dynamic models that have delivered now more than 140 million books and a large and growing list of resources. And we're proud of that and we're happy with that. But we know every day that we have to grow faster, that we have to do more, and we have to do it at a rate that's unprecedented if we're going to get ahead of the wave that we see coming. The second thing that keeps me awake at night is this. We need Gutenberg 2.0, and we need it now. We know from history what access does to build an educated population. Gutenberg taught us that. The mass publishing industry in the United States really ran full throttle in about the mid-1800s. So it shouldn't surprise any of us that after 150 years, that industry needs a major reset. The average price of a premium picture book in the United States today is $18. $18 is a price point that excludes everyone but the wealthiest five or maybe 10% of the US population. The publishers are not to blame in this, and I, anyone who works with publishers knows, knows that they are heart and soul in this battle. And they've been, they worked with us, they've worked with many, many other terrific organizations. But we also know, all of us in this room know, that publishing really holds the intellectual life of our country. And it can't be designed in a way that it's limited to the top 5%. At First Book, we're building a brand new market at the base of the economic pyramid for books and for educational resources. Our market has grown more than 30% every year, but we have to expand those efforts to reach every single child in poverty, to sustain and strengthen the current publishing industry, and most importantly, to make good on the promise of equal education for every single child. The third thing that keeps me awake is that books need to bo be both affordable and relevant. People have been citing a lack of relevancy, a lack of cultural diversity in children's books for decades. And yet, in the last evaluation by the University of Wisconsin, the percentage of non-white children's authors is about 8%. So there are wonderful books being written by a huge range of wonderful authors, 
but it's not enough. We're not moving it fast enough, and we're not even close. First Book's own research has shown that over 90% of the educators we serve have told us that their kids would be more enthusiastic readers if the books reflected their own lives. We've got to listen to a voice that strong. We've got to listen and we've got to act. Because between the high price of books and the lack of relevancy, we're facing a real chasm. First Book has launched something called Stories for All, and it's a program that's revolutionary because it's market-driven, and it is addressing this need, but we've got to amplify the results. We've got to move faster. Now, I can't close without giving you some good news, right? <laughs> Come on. We do know what works. We know what works. It's books. We hear from our network all of the time, and we receive letters like one recently I want to quote for you. Thanks to First Book, over the summer, our students were able to pick out new books. The results were phenomenal. Instead of falling behind, 95% of our readers maintained or improved their developmental reading assessment scores. 95%, I'll take that, <laughs> I'll take that. We know that providing great books and resources to heroic educators works, and now our task is to turn the volume up and fast. If we can scale our work over the next five years, we will reach one million educators, and that translates roughly into about 25 million children. Then, and only then can we sleep a little, maybe a nap, <laughs> with the thought that every child in this country has the equal chance to build their lives, to raise their families, to contribute to their community and to their nation. And here is the most hopeful thing. We can do this. We can do this together. We're so grateful for your help already and so grateful for this terrific day. Thanks so much. Congratulations again to all of our winners as you heard from these presentations. Inspiring, novel, sobering, uh, shows clearly all the hard work that all of these groups do and clearly they are very, very deserving of these literacy awards. Um, as part of our, a very special part of our program today, we will now have the opportunity to hear more from Kyle. David will join us now. David and Kyle will have a conversation on the stage here to hear more about uh, First Book and also more about the, as she mentioned, more than 25 years of experience in this area to, to inspire us even more. So why don't we start by where are you originally from? I'm from southeastern Ohio, Zanesville. Okay, and so you went to college where? I went to University of Iowa. What I know. Ohio. I, I, Ohio yeah, State. I don't have a great explanation okay, so for you that. You went to Iowa, <laughs> and then what did you major in? I assume not legal. English and writing, actually, okay. which was one of their great departments. So, so when you yeah. graduated, then what did you do? I went to law school here at GW. Actually, I'm a escaped lawyer like, like yourself. I okay. Yeah. So after you graduate from law school, your family said, okay, you're now going to be a great corporate lawyer. You're going to make lots of money. <laughs> um, what went wrong? Well, <laughs> the, uh, you know, my family was always dedicated. My family was always dedicated to education. It made a profound difference in our lives uh, as uh, my brothers and sisters that as part of the GI Bill, my father had been able to go to college. And that wouldn't have happened but for that governmental right. intervention. And so they believed deeply in that and they were also very socially motivated. So they actually, I, I went and practiced law for a while and Where? then I saved my soul 
by leaving I, there. But where did you gone. where did you practice? Law? I practiced here in Washington. At a, at a law firm. At a law firm, Anderson, Hybe, Nauheim, and Blair. Okay, and you were doing Indian law or not? I did law? some. I represented uh, uh, the Navajo Nation in partnership with uh, Peter Gold here, who uh, co-founded First Book with me, and. Uh, uh, so, and a huge range of corporate okay. clients. So yep. one day an epiphany happens. You say, I don't really want to do this for a living. I want to do <laughs> something else and I want to create first book. Is that what happened or how did it come about? You know, how it came about is I, it was right in the middle of the crack epidemic in, in Washington, D.C. And, and I was very aware that a town that I loved was under siege. And so I began tutoring at a little soup kitchen right down the road here called Martha's Table. It's, now it's grown, everybody knows Martha's Table. And, uh, and, so I, and when I went there, every night the place would be filled with 50 or 60 kids that were all doing the, exactly the right thing. They were coming in off of dangerous streets. They were looking for adult intervention. And we didn't really, at that point in Martha, Martha's Table's development, we didn't have a lot to offer them. And so I kept thinking, you know, like, what would this look like? What we could start reading to them. We need books, we need, and that began the process of looking at other neighborhood groups, looking, going into some of the schools and seeing what was not available there. And Peter and I, uh, started putting our, our thoughts together. So um, one day you went into your colleagues in the law firm and said, I'm going to just quit and go into literacy world? Is that what you said? It, it was sort of like that. I mean, we always had a sense that we weren't going to build a traditional nonprofit. And so it has a lot more business modeling behind it. Okay. Um, so when you told your family you were going to give up the practice <laughs> law, what did they say? Well. Uh, Mostly, they were pretty pretty proud. I think they were pretty happy that I was willing to roll my sleeves up and jump in. And you know, my I've got a proud tradition. My sister is here, uh, who also is a lawyer who works in the social sector. So she beat the, down the bushes in front of me, and I was able to walk the path. So what year was it that you started? Actually, 1992. Okay, and so where did you get your first money? We got our first check from Reading is Fundamental, and uh, they gave us a, a little starter grant, and then we got a, uh, a larger investment from Share Our Strength, the hunger relief organization. So how many people did you initially have in your organization, you and? Um, there were, we, we ran it on a volunteer basis uh, for a little while, maybe a year and a half, and then we hired a couple of young people to How come many in. people do you have now? Um, I think just over 80. Okay, and not on a volunteer basis. No, indeed, okay. no, indeed. So yeah. you have 80 people, and yep. now um, how many books have you actually purchased, would you say, over the years that you've been doing this? Well, we've given away about 140 million books, and uh, last year we hit about 15 million books in that year. It's a wonderful hockey stick, the, okay. the and growth And you curve. do it in the United States principally? Principally, although we are, we have expanded into Canada, and so we have an office just outside of Toronto, and we've been doing that for three or four years. So now you have several different programs, but one of them is you buy books, um, and then you distribute them. Yep. You have another program where people can go online and buy books at a discount. Right, it's two jet engines. One is called the First Book National Book Bank, and that was the, the model we designed. That's the older of the two. And we designed that on the understanding of the book industry and how, because it's a consignment industry, there's a tremendous backflow of inventory, right? And so we went to the publishers and we said, do you give those books away? And they did what they could, but it's a very expensive thing to manage. So we stepped into that space and built the first system of its kind that now manages the lion's share of contributed books from the publishing industry. That's the book bank. Then there's the marketplace, and these are very separate. And the marketplace is when we buy the inventory from the publishers. Um, and we, what we said to the publishers in that instance is, look, you really are constrained, your market, the way it's currently designed, the market for books is constrained to the top veneer 
of socioeconomic strata. And what we will do is we'll go out and aggregate the base of the pyramid. So we will pay for aggregation. We will buy on a non-consignment, a non-returnable uh, basis. For the, and that was music to their ears, of course. And then we also uh, said that we didn't, you know, they wouldn't have to advertise to us. So we basically took away all the risk from the market and we took away a lot of the cost. And we said, we expect your prices to reflect the fact that we're building a new market that, and, and that none of this risk is or expense is any longer on your plate. So are you bigger now in Washington than other cities or is you're everywhere? In the no, our, our network, we have an, an online system where literally anyone serving children in need, zero to 18 years of age, uh, can sign up with us for free. Title I classrooms and schools, uh, anybody, you know, Head Starts, healthcare centers, libraries, literally any, any place. They come on and they give us their bona fides online. And, um, and that system is free. And once they're in, once we've, we've certified them, then they can have access to both the book bank inventory, where they only pay for shipping, and the marketplace inventory where the average price of a brand new paperback book, including shipping, is 285. So what ages do you focus on? Jill? Well, we, we cover zero to 18. We're all the way up. And what about adults who can't afford books? Have you gone into that area yet? Well, we haven't, you know, by the time, I mean, we haven't overtly. By the time, there are a bunch of programs though where um, new moms will come into the program to, you know, get books uh, through, their, through their system to, to read with their child. We also have a lot of books that we specifically look for that are very high interest and, and low level vocabulary to begin to bring the older population, the older readers uh, into the system. So somebody gets a book from your system, a child gets two or three books and yep. they have them, but what do they do typically when they're done reading them 20 or 30 or 40 times? Do they <laughs> pass them along or do they hold them, put them in their library? What do they do with them? It's every story you can imagine. So, you know, there are some schools, some classrooms that build classroom libraries with them. There are some families that um, I, you saw them on, on Sally's uh, presentation, you know, family libraries, and we know how important that is for reading skills. We know that having a family library of even 20 books uh, has an extraordinary impact on the academic achievement. So it's some of them stay home with the kids, some of them get, ra you know, traded around from kid to kid. And, it depends on the program. And is there a difference between whether a child likes a book with a hardback or a softback? Does it make a difference? I don't think it makes a difference Does at all. Does it make all. a difference? Therefore, why do the publishers still publish a hardback? Is it presumably more expensive or? It, it's very much more expensive. And, um, and I don't think it makes a difference to the kid. I mean, I think that, um, uh, there are a lot of reasons people love the feeling of okay. hardback books, and it also, you know, is a lovely thing for a keepsake and things like that. So a lot of adults now are reading books online yep. and on Kindles or other devices. Uh, are children doing that yet? Do they have their own Kindles yet for children, or are they still reading books like you you, you, the kind of books you provide? Well, I don't think any, I don't think that and the digital content space has taken off anywhere nearly as quickly as the industry thought it might. And it sort of breaks down by age. Um, kids, uh, the older kids may not have Kindles, but they certainly, uh, there's a huge penetration of smartphones and smart technology, right? And so those were actually working uh, and, and providing an, an increasing opportunity for digital content uh, to you know, make that accessible through the first book marketplace. But littler kids, the technology isn't really there, you know, because you have to have uh, a unit that is simultaneously high quality enough that it right. can capture the artwork and it can also have grape juice spilled on it and be dropped down a flight of steps, right? And so. Well, who does a better job of preparing children to read, uh, fathers or mothers when they're reading? <laughs> 
Oh, man. When they're reading to their children, is there a difference? <laughs> uh, no, no, there's no not. You know, I think, I think that what we want is we want 24-7 surround sound for okay. kids. And if you don't have a parent, um, uh -huh. does it make a big difference for the child? Or who typically reads to the children if, let's say, they don't have a parent or they're one-parent families? Um, is it a big difference? you see a big difference in their literacy capabilities if there's a one-parent family? Um, I, don't th I think poverty is the main indicator on that. It's, it's when you've got caring adults, um, that's the most important thing. That's the most important thing. And when they're reading in the life of a child, that's a power tool. Okay. That's tremendous. So, I will tell you quickly that, that um, I've seen just recently some extraordinary programs where they are bringing older kids who are struggling with reading themselves in to read and tutor with, with younger kids in the same school. And the, the uh, impact metrics on that is breathtaking. So suppose President Obama called you up and said, I heard... He does all the time. He does, oh. no doubt. <laughs> and said, you've done a great job. I've heard about this award. I've heard about the organization. Um, I'll give you $100 million. Uh -huh. Actually, I'll give you a $1 billion. What would you do to improve the literacy in the United States with $100 million or a $1 billion? What would you do with that? Well, the first thing I would do is I'd make sure every teacher, every educator, every preschool setting had every resource they need. Um, right now, what we have is an army, forgive me for the military reference, but we have an army with no supply, with an inadequate supply system. And so I think that's the magic of what First Book is building. And with, with infinite funding or nearly infinite funding, our ability to upgrade IT systems, to market and make sure that every eligible teacher is uh, in the system and receiving the benefits. Right. You, you can't imagine what pent up uh, heroes there are out there. Teachers go into teaching, people are working at Head Start, and they've all got ideas about what they wanna do with the kids in their program. And so when they get resources, the lid blows off the place. So it's really, it's really inspiring. Have you ever thought of uh, going to public service and a different type of public service and going to government or, and, and changing public policies to make more along the lines you like, or is that not something you want to do? Well, I, I'd be very interested in being helpful in that. I'm not sure that I have the temperament for, <laughs> uh, for working on the inside, but I'm a terrific heckler, and, okay. uh, uh, so, and I'd, be, uh, I'd be very happy in that role. So what books do you, how many books do you read a year? Are you a big reader yourself? I'm a pretty big reader. A lot of mine, I have a 16-year-old son, sitting right there, and I have a 12-year-old son, and a lot of the books I read are books that they are reading. And are they, they have to be gifted readers because of your job? It's required by law, right. yes. Okay. okay, and you like to read uh, fiction, nonfiction? I tend to love fiction and historical fiction. Right. Yeah. And uh, today, uh, if you look back on your career, do you have any regrets in leaving the practice of law and you're very happy with what you've done? If you could do it all over again, <laughs> what would you do differently? You know, I, have, I don't have a single regret. I feel like the luckiest person in the world. I really do because I feel like I spent uh, a number of years in training as a lawyer and then a number of years working as a lawyer at the elbow of brilliantly talented uh, lawyers who were able to sharpen my skills and my analytical reasoning and my business skills. And I've been able to pivot and turn and apply that to something that um, it, it, it's tremendously meaningful to me. And I get to work with extraordinary people, some of whom are sitting here. So uh, would you recommend to your children that they go to law school? Yeah, actually, I, I would recommend it. But I not think it's law. I, and certainly not. I know I'm teasing. I you know I think it's great training. I think it's it's uh, I think it made me far more uh, capable in developing new business models. I think I uh, I don't hesitate to call people when I need their skill set, and it I think it I think it helped a lot. So where do you think your organization will be ten years from today? 
10 years from today? Well, we will certainly be global. Uh, we're already tiptoeing out. We've done uh, major distributions in uh, India and several other countries, and I think we, we did distributions in about 19 countries this last year, just pilots to start getting a flavor for what would be required. So definitely global. We already are expanding uh, into teacher training to begin to elevate what happens to those books when they hit the classrooms. And uh, because we, we wanna make sure that every leverage point we have that we really pull the lever to, to elevate impact. So I think, you know, and then expanding also the kinds of products that we offer. Books will always be either electronic right. or traditional will always be the heartbeat of the organization. But we've learned because we constantly are talking to this network that, that we've built. And they tell us kids are coming hungry. Kids are, are not coming to school because they don't have winter coats. And, so now we have this logistical system, we can make coats available. We can start you know, breaking down those barriers too. Uh -huh. So what is your budget now? Our budget, if you include uh, books and all, is over just over 100 million a year. Uh, our operating budget is just over 20 million. Where does that money, that 20 million comes from? Um, it's about 45% of it is funds that we uh, earn through the marketplace and the book bank. So it's, right. we're heading towards self-sufficiency. In fact, we believe in the next three or four years, we will be 100% self-funded. Really? How about that? Pretty good. Um, but we also have, at this moment, great corporations who have stepped up to help us and wonderful individuals. So um, I've always found in nonprofits, you should never say you're going to be self-sufficient because it's <laughs> hard to get the donors, but uh, that's my <laughs> advice. But, I see. Uh, so, I didn't say that. Okay. So uh, <laughs> when your children were learning to read uh, and their teachers were not doing as good a job as you thought they maybe should have, what did you say to the teachers? Or you always thought the teachers were doing a good job? I actually always thought the teachers were doing a pretty good job. I mean, I think that the, what, what we did at home was we just read a lot. And, and, and I think more important than, uh, than the curriculum in a lot of ways is having fun doing it and making it something that your kids see that you love and they become part of that. And that, that carries a lot. Well, look, you've done a great job and I wanna thank you very much for everything you've done for the thank country you. and uh, for the world eventually. Uh, well, thank starting you. first book, thank you very much. Thank you, and you know, before, <laughs> thanks. Before we break, I just want to say the Lincoln Memorial is my favorite <laughs> memorial. And on behalf of everyone in Washington and everyone in the country, thank you, thank you much. so much for stepping thank up you. on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much for sharing those words with us. And let's join again and thank David for sponsoring the <laughs> Library of Congress Literacy Awards. Congratulations again to our award winners. Thank you to our advisory board members here. Actually, thank you to all of you because it's working together that we can help with this problem that we have in the world, and that is fighting uh, illiteracy. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.